All right, so it's time for our open mic. Five minutes. Uh, we've got nine on the list, and we've got an hour, so we can stretch that five minutes just a little bit. So I never know what I want to read until I hear kind of what's come before, and I'd be foolish not to ride on the wonderful um, energy created by uh, Quentin and Nancy. So this is my poem. It's called Sugar House and the Drone of Bees. <clears throat> After the plane landed, we took a taxi into Salt Lake, Lake City that warm July evening. Your friend had a bungalow on the east side of Sugar House where we stayed in a small room down in the basement. Out in the backyard, a grape arbor shaded when wine poured into stemware and snapdragons attracted the drone bees of summer. Later that evening, old friends came to see you and I, as your lover, met with cordial suspicion. I walked the garden path in the soft sound of laughter, bird song in the distance up toward Cottonwood Canyon. You were in your element, and I, quiet in continuous wonder, listened for words falling out of the waking. In darkness, candles lit up the plum trees and allowed the night moths to fly. I, surrendering in a flickering of light and shadow, let the jet lag take me. Sometime later, you touched my shoulder, kissing me with my eyes barely open. You led me to the bedroom where up in Sugar House, we slept late into a new morning, the droning of bees. Open mic, Stephen Blue. <clears throat> I really like that Salt Lake City. So um, <clears throat> I'm working on a new uh, book which combines memoir and poetry. Uh, so I'm going to read a, this piece. It's a work in progress, but uh, I thought I'd, I'd try it out and see how it goes. The News. I tried to get uh, George and Pat together, two of my favorite musicians and friends. Pat from the first band I was involved in during the mid-60s. George from later in my late 20s later on, a drinking, drugging, and jamming buddy. Uh, both good singers. George was a proficient songwriter and piano player, as well as guitarist. And Pat was an excellent rhythm guitarist and singer. In 1980, I had this musical yearning and decided to try and get them together to see if we could gel. And then it happened. The news. They were already on their way to my house. We talked about the news then started to drink and get high. Our plan was to go to George's house where his piano was to jam. Stunned, numbed, we decided to stay with the plan. I needed to get gas. I was getting drunker and higher. We never thought much back then about drinking and driving or getting high and driving. We just did it. We were dumb and ignorant of the danger we could, we could be to others. But we always did keep a lookout for the cops. Pat grabbed the bottle of Corvo Gold and we drove to the gas station. I turned on the radio and then came the news again. The next thing I knew, I found myself standing in the middle of the road in a four-lane intersection, crying, pointing, and screaming at cars. You don't care. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. George dragged me back to my van. We headed north on the 101. Pat was riding shotgun. George was in the back. They started arguing and fighting. Pat looked at me and said, he can't play the guitar. 
I said, sure he can. George is a great guitarist. Pat turned his head to the back and said to George, you can't play the guitar. You don't know how to play the guitar. George shouted something back, and the next thing I knew, they were yelling, pushing, and hitting over the back of the seat. I shouted for them to cut it out, but they wouldn't. Everybody was drunk. Everybody was high. They had heard the news, and they were just at each other. I pulled off the freeway and stopped. I said, what is this? It's bad enough what happened, but what are you two doing? George got out and said, that's it. I'm out of here, and walked off. I told Pat, <clears throat> I'm going home. We turned around and got back on the 101 going south. Then I saw the red and blue flashing lights. I pulled the van over. Pat opened the door and set the bottle of tequila outside on the ground. The next thing I knew, he was bounding down the hill on the side of the freeway, running through the ivy. That was the last time I ever saw Pat. I'm all alone. The cop confronts me. He says, get out of the car. You know, I was stone drunk and high. I never had a DUI. He takes me to the side of the van and tells me to open the sliding door. Then he notices the bottle of tequila and says, what's this? And who's that running away? I started crying again and said, There's, there was three of us were in the van. We just got the news that the voice of our generation has been murdered, shot in the back. He gave me a long, hard look straight in the eye and said, Look, get, you get in your van and drive straight home. Do not stop and do not drive any more tonight. I said, Yes, sir. Thank you, officer. I jumped in my van and got out of there. I could not believe he let me go, but he did. No DUI, no arrest. He just let me go home. I drove home and put the TV on. I watched the news and candlelight vigils all night long until I fell asleep on the couch. I videotaped all the news over the next few days as the multitudes around the world gathered and mourned in crowds of tears, moments of silence, memorials, and candlelight vigils of millions. I'll never forget what happened on the night John Lennon died. So, uh, so in the book, I'll include a couple of poems, you know, related to the story. So here's two short ones. Uh, I wrote this one two months after John Lennon's death. All that's left, just before the end, glimpses of John and Yoko's private world, domestic haven from overwhelming celebrity. Sean came first. The music could wait. Death lurked beyond the gates. All that's left are the songs. Jesus died for our sins. John died for our dreams. <clears throat> and then this one is a, was an exercise from a poetry <coughs> workshop where you pick a photo from a book and write a poem about it. So I picked a photo by famous rock photographer Annie Leibovitz. And the photo is the one of John Lennon and Yoko Ono with John naked curled up on Yoko, who was clothed. It was on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine one month after John's death. He spoke truth to power. Naked to the world he stood, strong with principle for all to see. I'm troubled by the images that others would see in his honesty. Peace is often misunderstood, but is always, always contagious, vulnerable, and fragile. Curling up to the strength of a loved one, compassionate and unconditional, the universal feeling of peace flows unquestioned. Thank you. Next up, my good friend Joshua Mertz. Good afternoon. Many of you. Um, have heard me read before, and I usually read something amusing and lighthearted. Not today. Um, yesterday was Armistice Day, Veterans Day. Today is what's called Remembrance Day, and on this weekend, every year, I try to bring out two poems. Um, wars are made by nations. The suffering is by the soldiers themselves. Some wars must be fought. Most wars can't, but it all boils back to the soldiers. 
So the first one is Flanders Fields by John McRae. You may know this. In Flanders Fields the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place, while in the sky the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amongst the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders Fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch, be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with we who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders Fields. <clears throat> and the second one was written in World War I by a gentleman named Wilfred Owen. It's from a quote, Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori, which is Latin for it is sweet and fitting to die for one's country. Wilfred Owen was in the cavalry in World War I. They were still using horses. They were still gassing each other. They still had mud to slog through. And he wrote uh, from his experience, Bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock-kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed through the sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs, and toward our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched to sleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf, even to the hoots of gas shells dropping softly behind. Gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone was still yelling out and stumbling, and floundering like a man in fire or lime, dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil sick of sin, if you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from his froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie, dulce et decorum est, pro patria mori, for all our soldier friends. fairly new. Um, the first one, I think maybe some of my uh, fellow Red Sofa poets have heard, but I know most of you haven't. Uh, it's a gazel. It's an uh, ancient Persian form of poetry uh, comprised of couplets. Uh, each couplet is sort of its own distinct small poem. Um, the idea is that they will kind of join together and create something bigger than the sum of their parts. Um, the final uh, stanza or couplet of a gazel is often addressed uh, to oneself. Called Burials, bars, and streets turn silver. I dig holes in the backyard, plant Bibles there. What will grow? Thistles, thorns, a few dark songs, small weed-like prayers. There was a bar with a small stage where a woman was playing her poodle like an accordion. Back at her house, she played me in the very same manner. I have traveled far, sometimes deeply. I managed to avoid the trap doors on the moon. Rain has painted these streets silver. There is my wealth, my fortune. The cats in the neighborhood work in threes. I'm often caught in a triangular prison. Ornamental and still, they make lousy sentinels. The kid that I once was, Pale, scrawny, but fearless, always waving to the bums. Those cathedral arches beneath the bridge, 
proof that even the low are holy. Voices inside me, quarrelsome tumbleweeds. I remain a heretic and a heathen, not by choice, but temperament. I think a deeper sorrow might do this town some good. I've tried to square judgment with justice, mayhem with melancholy. I have written to myself several times lately. I haven't answered once. <laughs> Uh, the next poem's uh, brand new. Uh, it's part of a series I've been doing called Other Towns. Um, the idea is that, uh, you know, no matter where you're from, your hometown, you'll find something familiar in here. This is Other Towns, number four. It's in four separate sections. Uh, there'll be a pause between the sections. Other Towns, number four. There's a music falling from the trees. Some say the songs are old, some say that all the songs are new, but I can tell you that they are old and new. They are like our town, something ancient, something modern. The songs are as similar and dissimilar, as strange and common as our given days. This morning I went out walking through one of our older regal neighborhoods. There the citizens are finally surrendering to nature. Their yards wild and lush and overgrown. Many have lost their livelihoods. Many more are losing their minds, but most of them have sad and honest smiles. There the gardens are wrestling the houses under. The streets say, hello and welcome, dear brother, but they are quicker to say goodbye. I swear that we have a sister city somewhere in the middle of another distant swirling galaxy when its townsfolk stop to think of us, I imagine that they must fear for us. For our secrets are written on fallen leaves, and our shadows are dark, illegible maps of distant or non-existent non lands. Our poor souls depend on the scaffolding of bones. Our truths are often whispered, and our lies are often loud. And our prayers are like coins, lost or wasted, spent or misspent. The rumor of war takes the shape of a crow. A stranger may not recognize these things, but this town, in many ways, is just like yours. I have tried to be both sweet and funny. Some days I'm sweet, others funny, rarely both, blue moons being what they are. Oh, and the high, thick walls that keep one's selves from one another. Downtown in the business district, most of the merchants and bankers have the heads of birds. These are not masks, as the vacationers presume. Here the streets that run north to south are named after the many kinds of sorrow. The streets that run east to west are named after the trees. This afternoon I will meet my love at the corner of Sycamore and Melancholy. We will talk about the possibility of marriage and whatever that might mean. And we will talk about our town in the voices of those who will never leave. Thank you. Next up, Grace Richard. Hi. I have two short ones today. <clears throat> First one is called Late Blooms. Dahlias in full flower, drunk on autumn sun, heavy magenta heads, emotive and glorious. Many layered petals widen from spiraling saffron centers, curl and narrow to pointed tips, seductive as sensual lips. The topmost blossoms beckon, a rich halo of luminous color. I want them, want to be them, snip their long stems, Place them in a crystal vase where they soon droop and die, lives severed amid sharp prismatic patterns of light. The next one is called Illicit Haiku. <laughs> one woman, one man, so many stories to tell. Imagine one more. At the river's edge, startled birds flutter away amid tangled trees. 
your dimples, your smile, your hypnotic bedroom eyes make my heart leap up. Saturday market among the crowd can't resist a cappuccino kiss. Fingers on bare skin are touching as poetry, its rhythm our own. Morning cigarette takes you too soon from our bed. I breathe lonely air. Empty coffee cups, cool fog drips in, bittersweet end to summer's heat. Well, it's that time of year in which we um, spend a lot of time grieving, and certainly in, in Veterans Day, and also all the the victims of violence lately. But I wanted to um, share a tribute to some artists in Eugene. I worked for many years as a docent at the Schnitzer Museum, and right now there's a wonderful exhibit up by the work, with the work of uh, Margaret Coe and Mark Clark. And about a year ago, Mark died, and this is a poem I wrote for him when I was standing in the Karen Clark Gallery, um, which is run by his daughter. Lingering. Your spirit clearly lingers, Mark here in the quiet gallery where I sit alone with your death, facing three of your paintings. They glow with inner sun and flare with love for native place. I feel them breathing for you, mingling with landscapes by your wife and colleagues in an amiable family gathering. Air charged with affinity as milky blue hill greets a roseate canyon, and from another wall, a fallen tree in softest graphite responds. I wonder if you sensed you'd soon be off and away, once the canvases were so perfectly installed, these recent works with soft edges and liminal colors of a man at peace, placing each brush mark with consequential joy, leaving them behind for us. Which is what artists do, right? And finally, a tribute to a member of our family who happened to be a feline. Ambler, a.k.a. Mr. Boy, disappeared from our life in September and this is for him. He was 17, without a trace. Days since you walked away after breakfast, with milk, after breakfast and milk with purrs. One more try to open cupboard door and catch a snooze in nest of oven pans. Old legs bowed and weak bore you into heat and smoke. Ears deaf to endearments, you left. We come home to no cat, evening bowl untouched, no begging for second dinner. You wanted to do it your own way, the oracle card assured me, no teary adieu for me, your familiar would bring a return. We come home to no cat, we thought you might come back, imagine you buried in the yard. We come home to no cat, no goodbye, not uncommon to your kind. We longed to hold you in the, at the end. Absence swats at us. An ambler channel opens his message in translation, don't forget me. Remember not my bonus elder years eclipse, but me in my prime, climbing apple tree and onto garage roof, occupying cat hood counter, closets, tipping the wine rack, pretty red on white carpet. What? Not me. Playing pass red ball, 
my soccer's legs rapid catch and return, chasing wire toy with fake bird, hide and seek behind every door. Remember fun with running water, my long tongue lapping cold stream straight from bathtub faucet. I owned the house, every chair and laundry basket marked with fine white fur. How pink I kept my paws, kitten pink my whole life long. We don't know, gone over a week without a trace, facing absence, we call your name. Will you show up only in dream? All we know is how white hair clings to our darkest clothing. We don't know where you went, Mr. Boy, gentle soul with lion heart, deaf and toothless, claws sharpened when you merged with stars, wild wanderer from who knows where. And one last short one for him. He was very loved, by the way. He was a neighborhood celebrity. He always walked into people's apartments and homes. <laughs> Lunar traces. Two moons full since you left home. And as with a friend who's moved away, I sometimes forget how far. I expect to hear you purr underfoot by the blue asters in full bloom, which you missed this time, you who always helped tend the garden. Two new moons since I stroked your fur, cold rain comes to finish the bounty of purple figs. I watch for you at the door. I remember you curled up in the red travel bag of my friend, how you claimed the Christmas fur as personal forest settled amidst the bright gifts. Being unfamiliar with the protocol here, I brought one poem. But it's the opening poem of my latest collection, which is called Red Field. And that went out um, to some publishers on Friday to see if I get somebody to rise to debate. And Red Field is a collection that's a companion to a collection that was published by Utter Chaos Press in 2010 called Diesel Horse. Diesel Horse was about people who work with their hands. It honored blue-collar workers. And Redfield is, I would say there are probably 65 poems. And they concentrate on the people and the portion of our society that our resources tell us are the lowest echelon. And these people are difficult to consider entertaining sometimes, but I find them entertaining and they have their own dignity about them. Um, they sometimes commit crimes. They are very poor often. And so I write about them because I find them immensely interesting. Maybe I'm warped, but let's hope there's a publisher, editor out there who has a reader's eye that also wants to know more about these people. And the first poem in that collection is called Survival. I lived in Coos County for many years, which is an impoverished county with many social problems but I found it a beautiful place and dangerous and interesting people. This is survival. The list of supplies runs in the local newspaper. Warnings repeat on TV. We are supposed to prep for the big one, the mother of all earthquakes. In this huddle of bayside shacks known as the Crab Flats, We'll have less than seven minutes to race for high ground before a swarm of tsunamis repeat the Japanese and Indian killer ocean wave scene. We own flashlights and shoes, but no one here has extra cash to stockpile food and water if we should be lucky and survive. 
Our critters better run with us. As far as the marauders, the news article claims will come. We say, what are they going to steal? Crab flatters don't have much, but we're familiar with buck knives and unregistered guns. <laughs> How do you pronounce your last name? Shook. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm a, a local songwriter and novelist, uh, but mostly songwriter. And uh, it's kind of scary for me being up here without a guitar or piano be between me and you. So uh, yeah. poets are very brave, I must say. I'm going to... So I was inspired by... Stephen. Stephen has a series of uh, poetry books called Word Songs. It's a, a, a thing that he developed. And uh, uh, I, I thought, oh, well, that's a great idea. And he has uh, great books. I don't know if you've read them. You should if you haven't. I'm going to do um, something called uh, Song Words. So these are actually words from some of my songs, some of uh, the lyrics from songs, uh, because I like to think I put quite a bit of effort into some of these, so I'm just going to start out. Pull me from the rubble. Sometimes I don't know you. We're strangers when we kiss. We both want something different, but we're settling for this. Vulnerable, like lame game on the open plain, like babies in the jungle. Come on, pull me from the rubble. I just can't believe this loneliness we share. We're lonely when we're on our own, and we're lonely as a pair. And lonely is as lonely does. It's like living in a bubble. Come on, pull me from the rubble. And waking is the hardest part to do when someone you don't know lies next to you. When someone you don't love lies next to you. Yes, waking is the hardest part to do, and you know it's true. When someone you don't love lies next to you. Believing astrological myths, we've been blinded by the prayer. The laughs are superficial and the tears are just hot air. There's no blame and there's no shame. Don't even take the trouble. Come on, pull me from the rubble. I'm to my neck in this empty nest, so bring along your shovel. Come on, pull me from the rubble. Thanks for the inspiration. <laughs> uh, these, uh, this is uh, called, uh, this next one's called Sometimes the Wolves Are Silent, and it's about those things that haunt us in our darkest sleep sometime. Sometimes the wolves are silent. I listen to the howl at the bane at the moon. Suddenly, somehow, I've been singing that tune, but sometimes, sometimes the wolves are silent. I've been looking in the mirror at the danger and the fear. I can't help but stare because there's a stranger in there. But sometimes, sometimes the wolves are silent. And sometimes I get so lost in shame because when I listen to my song and all my inspiration and my pain reads like graffiti on a bathroom stall. There's an itching in my heart that I don't know how to scratch, a torch in the darkness that I, but I ain't got a match. But sometimes, sometimes the wolves are silent. Sometimes, sometimes the wolves are silent. And then just one more. And this is actually uh, the first song, not the first song I wrote, the first song I ever kept. And uh, so these songs, are, uh, these lyrics are kind of naked up here without the music for me, but uh, it's kind of interesting and it's kind of fun. So thank you for bearing with me. This one's called Strong Enough to Run. It seemed like simpleness, you take the best and scrap the rest after you exchange your apologies and thanks. But one thing you've got to know before I'm gone, I don't know if I'm strong enough to run. The current swept me out too late to try to turn about, but before I'm washed away, there's one thing I've left to say. It wasn't very nice to keep me hanging on, yet I don't know if I'm strong enough to run. But it'll be better for my moods, it will be better for my tunes, and it'll be better for the dudes who wait outside. And it'll be better for my soul, it will be better for my goals, and it'll be better to roll a brand new set of dice. And what I thought was paradise, 
was just another pair of dice. And just for one last time, I'd like to try to call your mind, but it doesn't help to know that you thought of me so low. And, and I guess I'll find a way to carry on. Yet I don't know if I'm strong enough to run. Yes, I don't know when my journey will be done, but somehow I'll be strong enough to run. My dad uh, died a couple weeks ago to Ralph Sullivan. But I'm going to do cheerful poems. <laughs> um, this is sort of a Black Lives Matter, white privilege type of poem. Uh, heretic. Uh, it starts with two quotes to move the plague. Can one be a saint without God? That's the problem. In fact, the only problem I'm up against today. Camus, the rebel, I proclaim that I believe in nothing and that everything is absurd, but I cannot doubt the validity of my proclamation, and I must at least believe in my protest. I am a merry heretic who loves to mock your major dogma, dear. I also laugh at catechism, so full of fluff and clogged with fear. There are so many things your dogma is so wrong about. I saw there were enough for me to write a song about. The first is that you let it make your mind incurious. The worst is excusing hate that would make Jesus furious. You say you always ask, what would Jesus do? Okay, good, but instead you always do what Satan would. Sociopathic goals dominate what you have planned. Claiming to be Christian, you follow atheist Ayn Rand. Most normal folks never even heard of her. She worshipped John Galt, the psycho axe murderer. Your budget acts would kill all hope of medical and dental, though universal care would save trillions, you get mental. Your rich puppeteers pay no taxes and get subsidies for drilling, but you'd cut their rates from zero and think oil wars are thrilling. Social Security is a savings plan, but you raided all its money for off-budget wars and Patriot Act snoops that think our rights are funny and Judge Dredd cops whose riots you incited shooting jaywalkers from tanks and they never get indicted. And uh, let's see. Uh, let's see, uh, this is another on the same, uh, same vein, I guess. Uh, Merry Christmas, let me live. Merry Christmas, let me live. I was just walking here, I can't breathe. In this season, I must give. Living laughter makes you seethe. You don't like my face, my accent, my race. High school bully, now a cop. You just want my heart to stop. Killing's not what upper brass meant. Jesus died from cop harassment. When you harm the least among us, he is reborn to say who stung us. You're being watched, collective conscience. Whether or not there are indictments, you're on the net, and now you're rich. You made a snuff film, ain't light of life a bitch. And this is an old one, but um, we're approaching Christmas season, so I thought I'd find it amusing to read it or sing it or whatever. <clears throat> Clanta Claus is coming to town. Oh, you better not laugh, you better not cry, because this psychopath is soon riding by. Clanta Claus is coming to town. He knows that you've been lazy, he knows you never vote. Although you think he's crazy, you're afraid to rock the boat. He's got a hit list, he's checking it twice, he can't read, so he's pissed. He's not very nice, Clanta Claus is coming to town. He calls himself a Christian, although he burns the cross. He thinks he's really bitchin', and they just made him your boss. He's king of the fools, he'll force you to lie. With prayer in the schools, refuse and you die. Clanta Claus is coming to town. He likes for you to be uptight. He hates for when you cut loose. He'll beat your kids if they're not white because he's into child abuse. Oh, you better watch out for this stupid cuss. If he gets more clout, it's back of the bus. Clanta Claus is coming to town. He rides around in sheets at night. He's the grand dragon of clowns. He likes to set the cross alight while he wears his evening gown. 
Oh, you better not pout, you better not sigh, when this drunken loud is telling you why. Can't clan a Claus is coming to town. He loves Nazis and skinheads, he's a true Republican. He's a, a Molotov cocktail pinhead, taking pot shots with his gun. Oh, you better not mix, you better not date, with his bag of tricks he'll seal your fate. Clan a Claus is coming to town. Just ask the other trick truckers. This guy has shit for brains. He's an ignorant motherfucker into gun racks, whips, and chains. Oh, you better not strike. You better not vote. Forget about rights. He thinks they're a joke. Clan of Claus is coming to town. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. <clears throat> this is called, I kid you not, they all said it. The surgeon sparkles, trust me, and I do. I feel so well taken care of. I feel good. I will be getting my life back. He tells me, if we do find cancerous cells in the removed tissue, no big deal. You just pop a little pill and it goes away. If you are going to get cancer, thyroid cancer is the best kind to get. Post-surgery and foggy-brained, he tells me that the biopsy showed those death cells. But it's good. No cancer was left in the margins. Catching cancer so early is really good news. If you're going to have cancer, papillary thyroid cancer is really the best kind to get. It really is. But just to be sure it's all gone, we'll make an appointment for you to pop that little pill. In a few weeks, you'll feel good as new. The endocrinologist who holds the key to that magic pill smiles and shakes my hand. She looks at the case notes and chirps. Well, if you are going to have cancer, thyroid cancer really is the best kind to have. All you have to do is be on a low iodine diet for two weeks. Come back and we will give you your pill. You will be radioactive. You will spend three days in quarantine. Do you live with anyone? Do you share walls? Do drink lots of water and flush the toilet at least twice. Hold on a second. I can't be around any living creature but I can flush my radioactive shit and piss into the sewer? In my head, I see a plume map. I am patient zero, irradiating Florence, Oregon. I don't hear the rest of the do's and the don'ts. I'm quarantined. I have to bag all my garbage during these three days and save it for three months before I can toss it? But I can still flush my radioactive shit and piss and it's no big deal? The doctor assures me, this is common practice. It is okay. Two weeks later, nuclear medical professionals explain it all over again. This time, I sign documents and initial each line item. I promise to be responsible with my radioactivity. But I can't help myself. I still have that plume map in my head. And I just promise to be radioactively responsible. <coughs> Doctor, how is it okay for my radioactive shit and piss to go public? Fifteen minutes later, he is annoyed, and I am unsatisfied with this is common practice. He leaves. The masked nurse enters wearing a lead apron. Gloved hands are holding a protective black box. Portable Geiger counter clipped to her, is clipped to her breast. She prepares to remove the pill from its shielded home. She says, yes, I kid you not. She says, if you are going to get cancer, thyroid cancer is really the best kind to get. <laughs> So I'm going to go a little lighter. <laughs> 
Uh, let's see. I'm sorry, I didn't put this in any kind of order. Sort of plan it by ear here. Let's see. I just moved here from Florence about a month ago. And so... Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> I was actually going to be here last month, but um, an event happened that made that not possible. This one's called, What Could Tears and Mormons Possibly Have in Common? I hear that knock on my door, and I know it is probably them. I shift the curtain, suspicions confirmed. It is them, missionaries wanting to share something significant. Them, who just drop in without warning, all tidy in black and name tags and skinny ties. Kind of like the quintessential FBI guy, prepared to speak some sort of truth. I was hoping to go unnoticed. I was hoping to avoid. But they are here without warning, and they saw me peek. I am not ready. There are dishes in the sink, scum in the toilet, and for God's sake, I don't even have a bra on. But they are here. I am not prepared for this. Nope. But it's my choice. I don't have to open up the door. I do not have to engage. But when tears come knocking, I too am not ready for that visit. They too show up unannounced. No warning, no notice, no declaration. I cannot keep them at bay like Mormon missionaries. I have no choice. They just march right in and tell me like it is despite dishes in the sink, scummy toilets, and braless breasts. Tears shouted out. Tears are honest when they show up. They utter what I know to be true. They are sharing something significant, and they and them are here without knocking. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna show one more. This is called Warning Systems. Partially conscious in that delicious, sweet, waking dream time, a thunder boom with James Earl Jones delivery pulls me closer to being awake. I hear the pelting of rain against my window and see flashes through my closed eyelids. The clock radio finishes the job arousing me by squawking an alert. Severe, wonder, severe weather storm warning, capable of producing golf ball size hail. If you are in the path of this storm, take immediate action to seek protection. Now I'm awake. I am excited by the thought of the hot dryness of the past few weeks being quenched. I am happy that I do not have to seek protection. I already have it in my warm bed. Aren't I the clever one? I am thrilled and energized by its capacity. Like Christmas morning, not knowing what's in those pretty packages, the potentiality of joy and happiness is almost more delightful than the gift itself. And then the adult in me remembers. I do not have a garage. My pretty new blue car could be pinged by golf ball size hail. Would that be covered by insurance? Or would I forever be destined to drive a dimpled vehicle? I like that there is a service out there to warn and protect me against potential danger. What if I could listen and hear the warning systems of my own life, be attentive to the dependability of my intuitive heart, and understand diverging points? To relish a delicious storm or seek shelter? To take immediate action to seek protection from a barrage of golf ball sized problems? Or let rational thinking be the fool? This trusting piece has me baffled. I know my heart knows but I do not have conviction of faith. There are no guarantees that I will not live a dimpled life. But if I take custody of my heart, it won't matter anyway.
We have just enough time for two more poems, and what better way to go out than the way we came in? So, Nancy, you ready to go? I'm ready to go. All right. And then we'll wish you all good night and come back again. Okay, well, we're a little past the season, the garage sale season, I'm referring to. Um, but this poem uh, might take you back a bit. And it's called Box of Rocks. Halfway beneath the table, lid torn back, two dollars scrawled in black marker on the side. These yard sale rocks, heavy as regret. Two dollars, the price of an accumulation. Scumbled with mud, collaged in dry leaf, bits of cobweb, the lost wings of insects. They glint like old loves, rugged stars. They too had lives once, arrived in this unlikely place because someone spotted a moon in them, because a hand reached out and said, you. Oh, to have been the one chosen, the hurried heartbeat of that. Dimple, curvature, an angle of polish, a palm that curled itself around our shape and in its closing became our shape. To have come through the tumbling and then this hardness we were shouldered into, the dismal weight of us, lid folded down, the cardboard darkness, our hearts ticking one against another. Quentin, please come and close us down. Is there a closing night party? <laughs> Is there a wrap party? All right. Um, Nancy has her mermaids. And I have mine. Thank you so much, Charles and Stephen and Barnes and & Noble and all of you for being here. I loved hearing all of your work, too. Thank you. When a mermaid comes undone, inconsequential shells, sometimes a chipped agate, pay them daily to the gods of hazard. Stealth is your best suit to unpucker those drenched lips. Hide in reef shadow, Avoid black-clad grief divers who grope after their own hearts. If compromise swims by, as it will, upend that raft of innuendo and guilt. Don't connive or flutter. Go deep. If you let it, forgiveness will eventually save you. Thank you very much. Big hand for our featured readers and for everyone who shared your I want to make just one announcement about next month. Um, Burning Down the Barns is Sunday, December 10th, but because there's some Christmas events going on, and still, instead of starting at 3 o'clock, we start at 2 o'clock. And we'll have three featured readers from the Osher Lifelong Learning Poetry Critique Group. So I hope you'll show up for that and come back for the open mic. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Living in LA. Everybody's got a Mormon story. They have to go out. Yeah, I know. Kids dig it.